In our exploration of the anatomy of the human body, we have begun to explore the topic of tissues. In Module 4.3, we continue our investigation of epithelial tissues. We have already learned some of their essential characteristics and most important functions. Here, we answer four more important questions. First, what is the relationship between the structure of epithelia and their classification? Second, what are the functions of these distinct classes of epithelial tissues? Third, what is the anatomical structure of a gland? And fourth, and finally, what do glands do? Let's begin now. First, let's begin with the classification of epithelial tissues. Epithelial tissues are typically classified based on their anatomical features. Epithelia can be found as a single layer of cells or as a multi-layered tissue. Those epithelia that are only one cell layer thick are classified as simple. Those epithelia that are two or more layers thick are stratified or compound. We will use the term stratified for classifying multi-layered epithelia going forward. Epithelial cells come in three basic shapes. They can be thin and flat. We call these squamous. They can be box-shaped. We call these cuboidal. And they can be longer, cylindrical or rectangular. We call these columnar. The classification of an epithelium, therefore, is a two-name system. The first name is based on the number of layers of cells. And the second name is linked to the shape of the cells. Thus, the name of a simple epithelium is called simple plus the name of the shape of the cells that make up the epithelium. We have then simple squamous epithelia, simple cuboidal epithelia, and simple columnar epithelia. The naming system remains the same for a multi-layered or stratified epithelium. We use the term stratified along with a name linked to the shape of cells. In stratified epithelia, it is the shape of the superficial layer of cells that is used here. Thus, a stratified epithelium with squamous-shaped cells at the surface would be a stratified squamous epithelium. In many stratified epithelia, we actually may find cells of varying shapes in the different layers. For example, the epidermis of our skin has cuboidal cells in the deep layers, but the most superficial layers are squamous in shape. The classification remains the same nonetheless. It is the shape of the superficial layer of cells that is used here. Thus, we call the epidermis a stratified squamous epithelium. Beyond these, we have stratified cuboidal and stratified columnar epithelia. There are also several classes of epithelia that are uniquely structured. We will revisit these when we discuss the functions of epithelial tissues. All epithelial tissues sit on a basement membrane. They are connected to it by the cells of their deepest layer. Thus, in simple epithelia, all of the epithelial cells are in direct contact with the basement membrane. Simple epithelia are thin. We will discuss their distinct functions shortly, but it should be clear that they are fairly fragile and cannot provide much in terms of mechanical or physical protection. Therefore, we find simple epithelia in protected areas inside the body, in which they will not encounter much exposure to physical or mechanical stresses. They line internal compartments and passageways, including the pleural, pericardial, and peritoneal cavities, the heart chambers, and the blood vessels. Because they are thin, simple epithelia are excellent at absorbing and secreting. We find simple epithelia, for example, in the lining of the intestines and at the gas exchange surfaces of the lungs. In these places, thinness is an advantage. While simple epithelia do provide a barrier to keep distinct environments separated from one another, their thinness reduces the restriction for materials to cross that barrier. Only the deepest cells of a stratified epithelium connect to the basement membrane. A stratified epithelium provides greater protection due to its thickness. Stratified epithelia are usually found in areas that are commonly exposed to mechanical or chemical stresses. Examples include the surfaces of the skin and the lining of the mouth and pharynx. One of the key principles in the field of anatomy and physiology is the principle of complementarity. The principle of complementarity states function is dependent on structure and that the form of a structure relates to its function. Let's list key functions of each class of epithelia 
and reflect on how their functions are related to their structures. We will also cite examples of where these tissues can be found in the body. First, the functions of simple epithelia. Simple squamous epithelia. Reduce friction, control vessel permeability, and allow for absorption. We find these lining internal compartments. Simple cuboidal epithelia are specialists in secretion and absorption. We find these in ducts and secretory portions of small glands, kidney tubules, thyroid follicles. Simple columnar epithelia are also experts at absorption, and they secrete mucus and or enzymes depending on the cell type. We find these lining the stomach, the intestines, the gallbladder, uterine tubes, collecting ducts of kidneys and elsewhere. Stratified squamous epithelia are the most common form of stratified epithelia. They provide physical protection against abrasion, pathogens, and chemical attack. We find these at the surface of skin, lining of the mouth, the throat, esophagus, and elsewhere. Stratified cuboidal and stratified columnar epithelia are much more rare. Stratified cuboidal epithelia secrete and protect. They create an impermeable barrier between two distinct surfaces in the body, which acts like a filter. It forces nutrients and water to enter these cells and pass through those cells in order to get to the other side. These are found mainly in glands, like sweat glands, the parotid salivary glands, and mammary glands. These specialize in selective absorption and secretion by the gland into blood or lymph vessels. Stratified columnar epithelia are quite rare as well. Their cells function in secretion protection, such as in mucociliary clearance. They are found along portions of the pharynx and epiglottis, and a few large excretory ducts. If more than two layers are present, only the superficial cells are columnar. Now to our unique classes of epithelial tissue. First, pseudostratified epithelia. These are actually a simple layer. They only appear to be stratified, hence the name pseudostratified, for false stratification. Their functions are much like those of true, simple, columnar epithelia. They protect, they secrete, they move mucus with cilia. We find these particularly in the lining of the nasal cavity, trachea, bronchi, and portions of the male reproductive tract. This brings us to transitional epithelia. Transitional epithelia are truly a squamous stratified epithelia. The superficial cells appear to be round when no pressure is applied to them, but flatten out and reveal their true squamous shape when pressure is applied. Transitional epithelia permit expansion and recoil after stretching. We find these lining the interior of the urinary bladder. As the urinary bladder fills with urine, these round cells flatten out, expanding and providing more volume for the urinary bladder to collect urine. Let us now address the issue of glands. Many epithelial tissues contain gland cells that produce exocrine or endocrine secretions. We will focus our attention on exocrine glands here, as we will discuss endocrine glands in great detail in Module 10 on the endocrine system. To briefly compare and contrast endocrine glands and exocrine glands, here are some of the similarities and differences. During development, epithelial tissues invaginate into deeper supporting connective tissue. Over time, the connection to endocrine gland is lost. Thus, endocrine glands are ductless. Their secretions, which we call hormones, are released rather into the surrounding tissue and absorbed by blood vessels, through which the hormones travel to the entire body. Exocrine glands are distinct in that they remain connected to the epithelial tissue from which they developed by a duct. Exocrine glands discharge their products through their ducts onto the epithelial surface that developed them. We can classify exocrine glands in a number of ways. Some of those classifications are based on anatomical structure, so we'll consider them here now. Based on their structure, exocrine glands can be categorized as unicellular glands called mucus or goblet cells, or as multicellular glands. You can see examples of unicellular glands exemplified 
by the goblet or mucous cells found here on the left, in a simple columnar epithelium of the small intestines, and again on the right, in a pseudostratified columnar epithelium of the trachea. The simplest multicellular exocrine gland is a secretory sheath, such as the epithelium of mucin-secreting cells that lines the stomach and protects it from its own acids and enzymes. Multicellular glands are further classified according to the branching pattern of the duct and the shape and branching pattern of the secretory portion of the gland. Briefly, three characteristics are useful in describing the structure of multicellular exocrine glands. One is the structure of the duct. A gland is simple if it has a single duct that does not divide on its way to the gland cells. The gland is compound if the duct divides one or more times on its way to the gland cells. Two, the shape of the secretory portion of the gland. Glands whose glandular cells form tubes are tubular. The tubes may be straight or they may be coiled. Those that form blind pockets or pouches are alveolar or acinar. Glands whose secretory cells form both tubes and pockets are tubuloalveolar and or tubuloacinar. Three, the relationship between the ducts and the glandular areas. A gland is branched if several secretory areas, tubular or acinar, share a duct. Branched refers to the glandular areas, not the duct itself. Additionally, exocrine glands can be classified according to their mode of secretion and according to their type of secretion. So, let's conclude with a brief discussion on the function of exocrine glands. First, let's discuss the different modes or mechanisms by which exocrine glandular cells secrete their products. When an exocrine gland cell produces a secretion, it releases it into the extracellular world via one of three mechanisms. The mode of secretion is specific to each gland cell type. First, merocrine secretion. Merocrine glands produce their secretions in the Golgi apparatus and secrete their products by vesicles. For example, sweat glands use merocrine secretion. Merocrine secretion is the most common mode of secretion. Mucin is a protein that is secreted via merocrine secretion. Mucin protein mixes with water to form mucus. Mucus acts as a lubricant and or a protective barrier and a trap for foreign particles and microorganisms. In merocrine secretion, the product is released from secretory vesicles at the apical surface of the gland cell by exocytosis. Two. Apocrine secretion. Again, with apocrine secretion, the secretion is produced in the Golgi apparatus. However, it is released by shedding of the cytoplasm. The apex of the cell, or the apical portion of the cytoplasm, becomes packed with secretory vesicles and is then shed. This happens, for example, in mammary glands. In mammary glands, we find both a combination of merocrine and apocrine secretions. Apocrine secretion, therefore, involves the loss of apical cytoplasm. Inclusions, secretory vesicles, and other cytoplasmic components are shed in the process. The gland cell then grows and repairs itself before it releases additional secretions. In holocrine secretion, the secretion is actually released by the bursting or rupturing of the cell. The entire cell becomes packed with secretory vesicles and then bursts. This happens, for example, in sebaceous glands, which are associated with hair follicles. They produce an oily hair coating by means of holocrine secretion. Holocrine secretion occurs as a superficial gland cell ruptures. Continued secretion involves, therefore, the replacement of these cells through the mitotic division of underlying stem cells. Lastly, in our discussion of the function of glands, we see there are many kinds of exocrine secretions, all performing a variety of functions. Examples include secretions that act as enzymes that enter the digestive tract perspiration on the skin to cool the body, and milk produced by mammary glands. Based on the type or types of secretions produced, exocrine glands can also be categorized as serous, mucus, or mixed glands. And these secretions can have a variety of functions. Serous glands secrete a watery solution containing enzymes. Glands such as the parotid salivary gland and the lacrimal glands, which produce tears, secrete serous fluids. Mucus glands secrete mucin that form a thick, slippery mucus. Some of our salivary glands, such as the sublingual gland, produce mucus secretions. Other mucus glands include those that rest just beneath the mucosa lining our digestive tract. Mixed glands contain more than one type of gland cell. They may produce two different exocrine secretions, one serous and the other mucus. 
An example of a gland that produces both serous and mucus secretions is the submandibular salivary gland. In summary, epithelial tissues clearly display the principle of complementarity of structure and function. From the delicate, simple squamous tissues that line the respiratory exchange surfaces of our lungs to the durable skin of the epidermis of thick skin. Furthermore, some epithelia specialize not only in protection and exchange of materials, but production and secretion of chemically rich fluids as seen in glandular epithelia. Join us as we continue our exploration of the tissues of the human body in our next study of connective tissues. <music>